Hello, it's Dr. Peg again here on Freedom Mountain at Elisha's home. And i um, excited. Another week has gone by and it's time to jump in and to study another great intercessor. And uh, if you've not been with us, we've been studying uh, prayer intercessors for several weeks. Some of the intercessors that we have studied have been Apostle Paul, Hezekiah, Jeremiah, Ezra, Moses, and there's a few others that I didn't mention, but those are the more prominent ones. And uh, just want to um, welcome you and uh, hope that you're getting a lot out of this series and that you are observing some of the uh, prayer techniques, some of the topics that some of these intercessors have brought up and uh, maybe some of their attitudes, um, things that maybe were right, things that were maybe not so right. Uh, but hopefully we're all consuming and um, looking introspectively and um, checking it out to see if we can be a better intercessor and to learn from the best, the best. So let's open with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the many blessings that we've had this week. We uh, continue to thank you for uh, our family and for our friends and um just blessings too numerous to be specific at this point because we'd be here for quite a while lord but we do thank you and we come in gratitude and heavenly father we um, we thank you for your fingerprints um, that are all over our lives and how there's evidence evidence that we can share as a powerful witnessing tool to others of your presence and our life and your power and your work in our life Holy Spirit, you are welcome here today. We give you full reign. We ask that uh, each one of us would attend with our spiritual eyes and our spiritual ears. And Heavenly Father, that we would have um, spirits that are uh, centered in and focused on hearing from you. And then as we hear from you to take and absorb your word, your directives, and to allow them to be imprinted on our spirit and then for us to walk uh, in your ways as the new man and so heavenly father we thank you um, for the time that you're spending with us today and we just pray heavenly father that uh, you will have your way and that we will consume and that we will walk deeper and uh, have revelational knowledge in your precious name we pray Amen. And so uh, just want to give a little disclaimer just off to the side. Um, keep in mind that as we are recording these messages that we are amateurs. And so we apologize when maybe the sound isn't working correctly or we apologize when maybe the, um, the message goes a little askew in the sense that there's a a space where for whatever reason it just stopped recording and then we have to dovetail it together and trust me I'm not the one who knows how to do that but just want to say this to you that you know last week someone contacted me one of my fashion gurus and said wow that orange lipstick wow well just to let you know I didn't have any orange lipstick on I don't own orange lipstick that was a lighting mishap and uh you know, have to chuckle about it, uh, but it, it was very comical when the person said that to me and I was like, wait a minute. And so when I went back and looked at the recording, I was like, whoa. So I apologize for that little lighting issue. And so hopefully we've got the lighting down a little better today so that it's not distracting and uh, so that we can fully focus on the word because that's what we're here for. So we just want to encourage you to open your Bible now to Genesis chapter 32. We're going to be looking at verses 9 to chapter 32. Jacob is the man of the hour today. We're going to be talking about what his name means uh, when he was first mentioned in the Bible. We're going to talk about his character. We're going to learn some interesting facts about him. And then we're going to see that he wrestled with God. And most importantly, we're going to take a look at one of the most important prayers that he prayed in his life. And so uh, 
just want to uh, encourage you to make sure that you have your notebook and that you've got your pen. And I know I say that every week, but um, for sure, for sure, in every lesson, there'll be something that you'll tell yourself, I'm going to remember that and I'm going to look that up. And when it's all over and done, you don't remember and you don't have time to go looking for it uh, on the recording. And so I'm just going to encourage you, keep that notebook there and that pen. And remember that we learn best by asking questions. So as we go through, if there's something that you don't understand, write down the question. Oftentimes when you go back through the week uh, and you have that question at the forefront of your study, oftentimes God will answer that almost instantly. And you'll be like, ah, I get that. I should have seen that. Okay. So just saying notebook, pen, a must, a must. So let's talk about the meaning of Jacob's name. If you want to uh, study this out a little further, you can write down a little note uh, to look up Genesis chapter 25, 26 this week. That's chapter 25, verse 26. His name is derived from a Hebrew verb, which means to follow. Now remember, Jacob was born grabbing hold of his twin brother Esau's heel. And so in the Hebrew, Jacob means one who follows on another's heel. And like I said, that's Genesis 25, verse 26. Now, his intention was to undermine his brother of both his birthright and his father's blessing. And so we see in Genesis chapter 27, verse 36, that he earned the name supplanter. All right, that's Genesis chapter 27, verse 36, if you wanted to look that up. So Jacob is first mentioned in the Bible in the book of Genesis chapter 25, um, where it speaks to the fact that his mother, Rebecca, Jacob's wife, uh, she's pregnant with twins, and she's inquiring of God as to why these two precious babies in her womb are fighting. And you can read that in Genesis chapter 25, verse 22. So God replied to her. He spoke of the foreshadowing uh, of the two nations that were going to rise from these two young men. And so Jacob would be the forefather of Israel. We see that in Genesis chapter 32, verse 28. And then also in chapter 35, verse 10 through 13. Esau would be the forefather of Edom in Genesis chapter 36. So keep in mind that Esau, as you study these two, he's the outer twin, but he's going to become the servant of Jacob, the younger. And we see this in Genesis chapter 25, verse 23. So now it's time to take a character assessment. Now, as we do this with each of these intercessors, you realize that it's really, really super important that when you assess yourself, that you look at your own character. Just saying. It's really, really important to look at who you are and uh, to really look at character. Now, I will say this to you. You know, um, oftentimes as we work with children, as teachers, we begin to ask, what qualifies and quant quantifies character. And so we always try to assess what critical experiences has this child had. So as an adult, you need to say that to yourself. Okay, what have I gone through in my childhood? Then what did I go through in my teenage years? And then when I became in my 20-ish years, my 30-ish years and Okay, after that, what did I become and what did I experience and how did that mold me and shape me and what conclusions did I draw from each of those experiences and how did that make me who I am? Now, let's just say this, that sometimes you can go through things and you can absorb um, untruths. I'll just call them untruths. So... When that happens, you begin to live out your life based on those untruths, and then your character begins to go awry. 
So, you know, as we go through something, we have to make sure that our uh, perspective is based upon the word because Satan would love to come in there and to get you to buy his bag of lies and then for you to take that little trail off to the left and then for you not to realize that you are off the path and on this little trail and he would love to just keep you over there for 10, 15 years till he can make a wreck of your life and then one day you wake up and realize, oh my goodness, when I came to that why, Instead of going straight, I veered off to the left, and I've been over here ever since, and my life is a wreck. So I want you to, to realize that it is very, very important that we look at our own character and that we look at the mirror of our spirit every day to make sure that we're on track. So we're going to take a look, like I said, at his character. Um, at the time of Jacob's birth, uh, he... Uh, he's wrestling with his brother, grabbing a hold. And so even from the very moment of his birth, his conception probably, between conception and birth, um, he has been the wrestling kind of guy. And so he is associated, his old man is associated with trickery and deception. So some of his notorious acts of trickery would be when he uh, convinced and took away his uh, brother's birthright. His brother was hungry, famished, as the word says. And so uh, he gave his brother a bowl of soup in exchange for his birthright. Now, who in their right mind would think that that is a proper exchange? And who in their right mind could be that absolutely hungry? Seriously. But that's what happened. So you can read about that in Genesis chapter 25, verse 29 to 34. And so we see in that portion of scripture where um, he receives Isaac's inheritance, which is a double portion. And so then Jacob later on, he robs Esau again of his father's blessing. And we see that in Genesis chapter 27, verse 1 to 29. And then also in verse 35 of that same chapter. And so that was Esau's right to receive that. And yet Jacob went in and stole that. Now, we don't have enough time today to get into the thick of parenting. But I'm just going to say this to you. If parenting is a big thing right now to you, and that's where you're at in your life, that you're parenting some young ones, some teenagers, this is an awesome character to study and the wife is an awesome character to study because I'm just going to give you a little glib there's favoritism there's favoritism on both parents both parents and uh, it, it doesn't turn out pretty in the sense when you look at the part that they played so you know you might sit there and say oh I don't have an issue with that maybe not but there might be something there that you might absorb. God might give you revelation in your journey of parenting. So we see that later on Jacob deceives his uncle Laban. In the 20 years of service, he tricks his uncle uh, into giving him his desired choice of wages, which were the speckled and spotted sheep and goats. And the way that he did that, he stripped back the branches of the poplar, the almond, and the plane trees place them at the water troughs where the strongest animals came to drink and to mate and you can study that more out in Genesis chapter 30 verse 25 to verse 43 now for some interesting facts of, about Jacob uh, his grandpa we know is Abraham he was known as the father of the faithful and you can see that in Genesis chapter 12 verse 1 through 3 and then um, Jacob and Esau is really obvious that they are two totally opposite character packages but not only that are they they are two totally different packages as appearance so you know remember that Esau he's the outdoors guy he's out there hunting and um, doing all that stuff that 
you know, men do outdoors. Well, you've got Jacob, he's just as content to stay inside, to cook, and do all the things that are done inside. Now, in appearance, two totally different. All right, you got Esau, who is this brawny guy with um, thick covering of red hair. And then you've got uh, Jacob, who is um, denoted as having smooth skin. And if you want to check that out to make sure, uh, that's in Genesis chapter 25, verse 25, and then Genesis chapter 27, verse 11. So though Jacob was a trickster, God did bless him throughout his life. Now, he didn't remain a trickster, and so that was his old man. We're going to be talking about his new man in a little while. Um, but there is this story that as he was traveling towards Haran, that uh, he laid down in the desert, and uh, he dreamed of a staircase that led to heaven. Angels ascended and descended, and then God appeared to him and blessed him as he slept. You can see that in Genesis chapter 28, verse 10 to 19. And so this is this story we hear uh, people referring to it as Jacob's ladder. And then we see that Jacob, in his own life, he becomes a victim of deceit. Uh, his uncle Laban, uh, he had him work for seven years of service. Uh, Jacob goes to his wedding and he thinks that under the veil that he is marrying Rachel, his first pick, which was the youngest daughter. However, later in the evening, he finds out he's got the wrong woman. He's got the older sister, Leah. So he goes back to Laban and asks, you know, hey, what's the deal? And, you know, makes it known that he's interested in the youngest daughter again. So he works for seven more years. And you can see that story in Genesis chapter 29, verse 18 through 30. Now, Laban uh, was tempted to cheat Jacob out of his wages. And you can see that in Genesis chapter 30, verse 25 through 36. Um, note that later on, we see in Genesis chapter 35, verse 23 to 26, that Jacob is determined by God to be the patriarch of the 12 tribes of Israel. Right, so we're giving you lots and lots of background information to get us to the point that we can study his prayer. All right, so there are three verses that I just want to give reference to. Uh, and actually read those to you that say something about Jacob that I think is significant. In Hosea chapter 12, verse 2, The Lord has a charge to bring against Judah. He will punish Jacob according to his ways and repay him according to his deeds. Now, as I've been studying Jacob this week, um, you know, the scripture that talks about that whatever you uh, so you will reap. You can see that all through Jacob's life. So let me just say this to you. If you sow corn, you're going to reap corn. If you sow red beets, you're going to reap red beets. So you want to be thinking about what you're sowing, right? You want to be thinking about what it is that you're sowing because it's going to come back. And you better hope that when it comes back, you like what you sowed right and you might not see that immediately but you know as you get older and you look back through your life you're gonna see okay this harvest time yep this harvest time yep this harvest time yep okay it is a godly principle a godly law whatever you sow you're gonna reap so you wouldn't expect the farmer to sow corn but when he goes out at the end of the season to harvest, you wouldn't expect him to find broccoli in his garden or his field, right? So whatever, it's, it's a real easy principle. Whatever you sow, that's what you're going to reap. That's what you're going to reap. So then in Genesis chapter 27, verse 26, Esau said, isn't he rightly named Jacob? This is the second time he has taken advantage of me. He took my birthright. And now he's taken my blessing. Then he asked, haven't you reserved any blessing for me? And then in Isaiah chapter 41, verse 14, 
Do not be afraid, you worm Jacob, little Israel. Do not fear, for I myself will help you, declares the Lord, your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. And so why did Jacob wrestle with God? Um, let's check it out and find out. We see that uh, when Jacob is returning home after he's run off, uh, you know, years ago, and he's got his two wives and children, and he's got all of these um, men and women that are servants helping to take care of him, and thousands of animals that he's bringing this way. Um, you know, he's a little nervous. He's a little nervous because his brother had said he had threatened that he was going to kill him for his past trickery. And uh, he's on his way in chapter 32 of Genesis, verse 6, to meet this brother. And so, you know, he's got all these gifts of appeasement that he thinks is necessary. And uh, he is afraid for his life and for his family. He's prayed to God uh, for help. He sent his family on and his possessions on ahead of him to protect them. And now he's left alone uh, at the camp. And it's this story is in Genesis 32, verse 24 to 29. We can see that he's at the camp all by himself. And God has come and he's wrestling with Jacob. And he wrestles with him all night until daybreak. Now. If you read that scripture, we're going to talk about this a little bit more. We'll show you a little bit more. But notice, who started this struggle? Who started this struggle? All right. And then who puts a stop to the struggle? Who has the control? So this struggle is symbolic of Jacob's inner self. Right? So God wants to have a relationship with Jacob. But, you know, like Jacob just can't seem to break loose of the bondage of his self-reliance or his deceit or his trickery. So when we read in this story, we see that he refuses to surrender to God. And so there's a touch that happens to Jacob's hip and he's forced to surrender and he has to admit his need for God. And so we see this in chapter 25 and chapter 26. So, now, we all know that his name becomes, from Jacob, it then becomes Israel. So, we're going to talk about that for just a few minutes. Now, a lot of this we're going to go into in depth in just a few minutes, all right? The things that we need to. So, we see that he's blessed with a new name. His new name is going to be Israel. And we see this in Genesis chapter 32, verse 28. He's got a new identity and he no longer, from that point on, has to be associated as a swindler and the trickster of his past. He's a new man, a new man in God. So he's a new creation filled with God's abundant blessings and a divine purpose to establish the Israelite nation. So, you know, some would say that names in the Bible have a bigger significance than they do now. You know, I'd have to agree with that. I'd have to agree with that and say that, yes, that's fact. But I say to you, should that be? Should that be that when we name our children that we just pop out a name because, hey, I like the way that sounds? Or should we be careful as to remember that every time we say that child's name, we are professing whatever that name means over that individual? Now, I don't know about you all, but as I've raised my boys specifically, I know that there's times that, you know, when they got into mischief, uh, as most mamas can agree and nanas, you know, their whole name comes out. So it's not just their first name. It's not just their middle name, but it is their first, middle, and their last name. So you want to be super careful that the entire name is a godly name, one that as you call that out, you know, if you've got one that's a little difficult, you might be calling out that full name more than maybe you're just calling out that first name. So you want to be careful that you've got a godly name so that when you're, you know, just spouting out that name and getting their attention, that you are proclaiming 
I'm prophetically declaring whatever their name means over them. And so, you know, yes, it's true that in the Bible it would appear that names were more significant, but I'm not sure that I agree that that's how it's supposed to be. I believe that names should be significant today. So let me just say this to you. If you've never done a study on your own name, you should. You should check and see when your parents were calling out your name, what were they professing over you? And was it something godly? Now, if it wasn't something godly, then maybe that's something we need to talk about. Maybe we need to go before God and say, hmm, I need a name change. Because every time somebody calls out my name, they're calling this out. And I really don't need this to be called out over me. So that's something that I want you to pray about and to ponder. Just ponder. So we see in Genesis chapter 31, 32 that after this wrestling, Jacob has a permanent limp. Now let me just say this to you. Do you ever think that as he's permanently limping, that his mind stops to think where that limp came, why that limp came? And he lives with that for the rest of his life, that permanent limp. And so that's a reminder. So, you know, I say to you, as we read, we try to uh, relate to the Bible characters that we study. Is there anything in your life that helps you remember a certain point where you changed for the good? Maybe things weren't right. You wrestled with God, and then after that, there's something visibly or there's something that you remember that reminds you of who you were and then reminds you who you are now as a new creature in Christ. So, you know, we often ask, okay, so there's Jacob and we've got that story. So how does that relate to me? Well, is there anything in your life that you were known as in your younger in your younger life some of you may not be to that point where you really have a younger life but you will so stop and ask yourself you know what was your identity and what caused that identity and what is your identity today and is your identity today what it should be and if it's not what do you need to do about that is there something more that you need to seek the face of God something that you need to lay down is there something that you need to um, to address? To address, you know. Sometimes we just shove things under the carpet, and ah, I'll do that later. But I say to you that you know, if God brought it to your attention today, today's the day. Today's the day. Don't put it off. Don't shove it under the carpet because you know, um, the more you shove it under the carpet, there's gonna be bumps in the carpet. <laughs> it's gonna be obvious that you're a person that just shoves your dirt underneath the carpet and that's not very becoming not very becoming so let's open our Bibles now we're going to take a look at uh, Genesis and we're going to start looking at uh, verse 9 to 12 in chapter 32 and this would be the portion of scripture that deals with Jacob's prayer all right and so let me just remind you that as we go to prayer, our prayer comes out of a source. And so, you know, as you're getting ready to pray, before you pray, you should ask yourself, what's the source of this prayer? Is it compassion for the person that I'm praying for? Is it a desire to seek mercy and grace for someone? Uh, is it vengefulness, right? Is it revenge? Is it anger? Okay. Just something to think about. So here we go. Verse 9. Then Jacob said, O God of my father Abraham and God of my father Isaac, the Lord who said to me, Return to your country and to your family, and I will deal well with you. I am not worthy of the least of all the mercies and of all the truth which you have shown your servant. For I crossed over this Jordan with my staff, and now I have become two companies. Deliver me, I pray, from the hand of my brother, from the hand of Esau. For I fear him, lest he come and attack me and the mother with the children. 
For you said, I will surely treat you well and make your descendants as the sand of sea, which cannot be numbered for multitude. And so then Jacob said, uh, for fear, reacting in fear and unbelief, we see that Jacob did the right thing. He went to the Lord. He prayed a good prayer, a humble prayer, a prayer full of faith. A prayer full of thanksgiving and based on God's word. So here's the thing that we need to remember that um, God, God points out here that Jacob's fear, initially we would say, you know, fear is not, not the right thing. But what do you do with your fear? When fear comes knocking at your door, what do you do with it? Do you just sit and nurse it and rehearse it? Or do you go run into your war room and do you go into prayer? Now, here's another thing. You know, fear can cause us to either quake in our shoes or fear can make us come to a point of reality where we look at our life, the past, we look at where we're at, and we submit and surrender and lay it down to God. Now, third thing. Fear, right? Fear oftentimes will put us in a position that we know that we need to come to the war room in the mode of prayer. But how? How do we pray? So we need to come in and we need to grab hold of a suitable promise from God that we can bring before him. He says to remind him. And so I usually say, you know what? Remind him. And then if you have two to three reasons that you can give to convince and persuade godly persuasion, no harm done, right? No harm done. So here he says, um, the Lord who said to me, return to your country and to your kindred and I will deal well with you. So we notice that Jacob's prayer had God's word. In Genesis chapter 31 verse 3 we see what God said and so he also he quoted God's promises I will surely treat you well and he's remembering God's words that were spoken in Genesis chapter 28 verse 13 to 15 so many of our prayers fall short because there's no word in them it's a wish list it's not based on I know that I can go before the throne and request this because the word says. It's just, uh, I want to. That's what I want, so now I'm just going to come asking for it and hope and wish. It's not even a hope based in the word. It's just a, a wish, right? And so, you know, when we pray, we need to have a verse that we stand on for each of our prayers. And that can be something that uh, with due diligence, it takes time to build that, um, that habit, but it's a good habit to get into. And so it's a good thing when we see his prayer, he remembered what the Lord said to him. So do you revere God's word and do you treat God's word as though uh, it's precious. Is it precious to you? It should be. Notice he says, I'm not worthy of the least of all the mercies. So this is an example of his humility and his thanksgiving. He knew that he was not worthy of what um, God did for him and what he asked God to do for him. But he knew that he could rely on God to stand on the promise that God had spoken. And so it was not because of his own worthiness. It was because of who God was and his trust and reliance that had developed in looking towards God. So notice that while uh, Jacob is pleading his own unworthiness, he's not slow to plead God's goodness, right? Now, he says, deliver me, I pray. So this is a line of faith. He's boldly come 
uh, to ask God to do something. He's given humble grounds for why God should fulfill his word. Now, I love to give quotes, especially when they're worthy, worthy to remember. Kind of like, you know, how Pastor Tim loves to give us little nuggets right out of his Bible, you know, that he's written down. This is one that uh, I've thought for years was a really poignant thing to think about. So this is uh, a quote from George Mueller, a great man of faith and prayer who uh, once asked what was the most important part of prayer. And uh, he said, the 15 minutes after I have said, amen. Let me say that again, just in case. My screen went blank, so I'm hoping that you got this. So I'm going to repeat myself to make sure. George, George Mueller was a great man of faith and prayer. And uh, he was once asked what the most important part of prayer was. And this was his answer. The 15 minutes after I have said amen. So no matter how great the prayer was or is, it's the faith after the prayer that makes the mark. That's the most important part. How you're going to walk it out. All right. So. Let's take a look now at verse 13 to 21. And uh, this in this portion of scripture, we see that Jacob has sent many gifts ahead to Esau. So he lodged there that same night at the camp and took what came to his hand as a present from Esau, his brother, 200 female goats, 20 male goats, 200 hues, and 20 rams, 30 milk camels with their colts, 40 cows and 10 bulls, 20 female donkeys and 10 foals. Then he delivered them to the hand of his servants, every drove by itself, and said to his servants, Pass over before me and put some distance between successive droves. And he commanded the first one, saying, When Esau my brother meets you and asks you, saying, to whom do you belong, and where are you going? Whose are these in front of you? Then you shall say, They are your servant Jacob's. It is a present sent to my lord Esau, and behold, he also is behind us. So he commanded the second, the third, and all who followed the droves, saying, In this manner you shall speak to Esau when you find him, and also say, Behold, your servant Jacob is behind us. For he said, I will appease him with the present that goes before me, and afterward I will see his face. Perhaps he will accept me. So the present went on over before him, but he himself lodged that night in the camp. So he sent an impressive gift, like my brain doesn't quite wrap around that in the natural. Uh, when I think of the expense of all of those animals, and you know, I'm sure that this was just a portion, this was nothing in comparison to all that he had. And so, um, you know, you ask yourself, okay, is this a, an attempt to buy your brother's good favor? Kind of would seem like that, wouldn't it? So he says, I appease him with the present that goes before me, and afterward I will see his face. Perhaps he will accept me. So it's as though he's saying, well, when all else fails, pray. So as soon as he's finished praying, he concocts his own strategies. Now don't sit there and act like you've never done that. Come on. We've all done that. We've all prayed this holier than thou, righteous prayer, and anybody listening would think, wow, wow, such faith. And then you go out of the church, and within the next 24 to 48 hours, you're busy, your mind's going, and you're just concocting your very own, yeah, your very own strategy. Don't even tell me that you've never done that, because I'm not buying it. 
not buying it one iota. So, so the present went on over before him. So he's trusting still in his own abilities to make things happen apart from trusting God. And so how about that song that we all sing? All to Jesus I surrender. All to him I freely give. I will ever love and trust him in his presence daily live. I surrender all. I surrender all. All to thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender all. But notice that, is that what Jacob really meant? Or did he mean, I surrender all the goats and I'm, that's not enough. Well then, I surrender all the sheep. And if that's not enough, I guess I'll surrender all the camels. And so, at this point, he's refused to surrender himself. He is truly trusting in himself versus God's promise of protection on him and his family. Now, notice in verse 22 and 23, we see that Jacob sends all his possessions over the river. And he arose that night and took his two wives, his two female servants, and his eleven sons and crossed over the ford of Jabbok. He took them, sent them over the brook, and sent over what he had. So he took them, he sent them over the brook. And so this is a demonstration of his faith in that sense where he leaves himself right he leaves himself behind and if we see that you know if Esau was going to attack the group then he would be quickly backed up against the river so sent over what he had so he spent the night alone it's the last night on the east side of the Jordan River and probably his very last night spent in prayer before the encounter with his brother and so once he was alone God commanded his full attention so he's thanking God he's remembering all that God's done for him wondering how God's gonna perform and to fulfill the work in him and so we see that this is a significant turning point in Jacob's life and he knew it in verse 24 and 25, we see a man, now notice, a man with a capital M wrestles with Jacob. Now, if it was just a typical man, it's just a little M. We don't have to be in English class to know that, okay? So it's in the middle of the sentence, capital M. So that means that it's a Theo experience. Then Jacob was left alone and a man, capital M, wrestled with him until the breaking of day. Now when he saw that he did not prevail against him, he touched the socket of his hip, and the socket of Jacob's hip was at a joint as he wrestled with him. So a man, so it wasn't just a man, it was, who was that? Capital M, who was it? It was God. And so where does the wrestle come in? The wrestle comes in, we said that this is an imagery for his inner reliance upon himself. There's a fight going on on the inside, a battle like you've never experienced maybe, but I bet you have. So he's got some pride, some self-reliance. He's got that fleshly scheming thing going. Remember, he sent all his family. He stayed behind. And so God came to take his position in Jacob's life and to take it by force if necessary. If necessary. So at this point, this is a pretty scary point for Jacob, right? He's either going to get to the point where he gets tired and okay, that's it. And he's going to let go of it or, I don't know, how are things going to go? How do they go when you keep relying on yourself? They don't go too well, do they? So a man wrestled with him. So we know that this is not a mere man. We know that this is a special appearance. Um, God in human form. Now, stop and chew on that. 
That's pretty impressive. Pretty impressive. How do you think that Jacob felt a few days, a few weeks, a few months, a few years later? Do you ever think that that left him when he realized that he actually wrestled with God? You know, it's not like he wrestled with the neighbor. It's not like he wrestled with one of his buddies. He wrestled with God in human form. So notice the portion where it says, until the breaking of day. So we can only imagine what this scene might have looked like. You know, did it look like a barroom fight? Did it look like an intense wrestling match? Um, you know, how we always say visualize, visualize. Not sure what it looks like in your mind, but think about it. It probably looks similar in most of our minds. And so, you know, Jacob wrestled. He had too much of self and too much of self-sufficiency. And that's how he got into the situation that he had to be wrestled by God. And so we see that, you know, when you are full of self-reliance, this is rebellion. This is rebellion because you're not submitting to God. You're not allowing him to have his way. And so when we stop and think about this, you know, the whole night there was a wrestling going on. Now, at any moment, God could have turned the tide and just said, okay, that's it, right? But he didn't do that. He waited for Jacob's plea. He waited for Jacob to be ready. And this is what Jacob says. And he said, let me go for the day breaks. But he said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. So notice that the me is capital. That's God. That's God. Let me. God speaking. Let me go for the day breaks. But he, meaning Jacob, said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. So, is he coming to his senses? Yeah, I think he is. So, he wasn't trying to dictate circumstances. But remember, we had looked at Hosea chapter 12, verse 3 to 5. And Jacob had sought God's blessing with weeping. He knew he was defeated. And he desperately wanted to be a blessing or to receive a blessing from God. Now, I'm going to read this portion of scripture for you. Hosea chapter 12, verse 3 to 5. He took his brother by the heel in the womb and in his strength he struggled with God. Yes, he struggled with the angel and prevailed. He wept and sought favor from him. He found him in Bethel, and there he spoke to us. That is, the Lord God of hosts, the Lord is his memorable name. Again, that was in Hosea chapter 12, verse 3 to 5. So unless you bless me, unless you bless me. So he's at the point where he's willing and ready. He's at the bottom of the barrel, and he is ready to rely completely on God's blessing. And so he's not going to reduce the hold that he has on God until God blesses him. And then he's not going to fight anymore. And so this is a changing point. This is a changing point. So in Genesis 32, verse 9 through 12, we see that, um, you know, God is answering Jacob's prayer. And that he's being delivered from his own self-will and his own destructive self-reliance. Verse 27 to 29, we see that his name is changed and he is a blessed man. He is a new man. So he said to him, what is your name? He said, Jacob. And he said, your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel. For you have struggled with God and with men and have prevailed. Then Jacob asked, saying, Tell me your name, I pray. And he said, Why is it that you ask about my name? And he blessed him there. So Jacob must have known what his name meant. 
he felt a sense of shame and so he knew that it was associated with all of his deception his cheating and yet he knew that that's who he was and he had to come to grips with that and admit that before God and so we see God's not going to allow him to cover up his name he's not going to allow him to cover up his identity he knew what his name was and he said what is your name right he didn't need to hear Jacob say hey hey God you know I think you forgot my name's Jacob he didn't need to hear that that wasn't for his sake you know there's a lot of times that God will do something and he's not doing it for himself he's doing it for us he's doing it for us because we lack we lack and sometimes we're a little dense so he says to him hey what's your name and so the light bulb goes on hey my name is Jacob and then ching 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 it's clicking and he's like hmm yes my name deception and cheating and I'm sure his spirit was saying it it is time to stop and so he says your name shall no longer be called Jacob but Israel now Israel when you study out that name it's a compound of two words it means Sarah it's a compound of Sarah which means to fight to struggle to rule and the second portion is L which means God and so this uh, means God rules so what a powerful name to go from this cheating name that he had before and now he's got a name Israel which means God rules powerful stuff powerful stuff so for you have struggled with God and with men and have prevailed he prevailed in the sense that he endured through his struggle until God thoroughly conquered him and God won that battle and the only way for him to win for Jacob to win was for him to lose and to give up and to know that he lost in the physical but to know that in the spiritual he won and that he would prevail and so it was right there and then that God blessed him and so he went from his the passing of his old from the Jacob life to the new the Israel life so he was blessed there at the place of a special trial and testing he was blessed at a place of intense pleading to God he was blessed at a place uh, where he saw the face of God and he was blessed at the place of his consciousness of his blatant weakness now there's two memorials to this event in verse 30 to 32 we see this and God and Jacob called the name of the place Peniel for I have seen God face to face and my life is preserved just as he crossed over Peniel the sun rose on him and he limped on his hip therefore to this day the children of Israel do not eat the muscle of that shank which is on the hip socket because he touched the socket of Jacob's hip in muscle that shrank and so he called the name of the place Peniel. This is the first memorial to the name. And so Jacob names the place Peniel, which means face of God, because he did know that the man with a capital M, that was God that wrestled him, and that he was the same one who wrestled with Jacob all of his life. And then notice that he limped on that hip, the second memorial, that perpetual limp he would remember that he had been conquered by God every step that he took for the rest of his life and so some may look at that as a thorn but others may look at that as hmm as the man in the natural he must have needed that he must have needed that to remind him he's walking as a new man as a new man so I hope you've enjoyed our study on Jacob. There was a lot to consume. Hopefully you took some really good notes. And we're going to go ahead and close now in a word of prayer. 
and I pray that you'll have some uh, quiet time this week that you can study and walk in a little deeper. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word and we thank you that uh, it is never void. We thank you that there's revelational knowledge that if we seek that you will give us revelation. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for the profound words that uh, you declared over Jacob's life and how you uh, expressed to us that we can't deny the old man who the old man is, that we have to declare and to decree who that is and then to receive the blessing of becoming the new man. And uh, in some cases, we may need a new name. So Heavenly Father, we thank you for uh, pointing out the different factors that are there in that process. We thank you, Lord, for uh, his prayer and the example that it was to each of us. We ask, Heavenly Father, that you would continue to extend our prayer life and that you continue to teach us uh, to base our prayer on your word. Lord, I pray that you would bless all those that have attended. I pray that you would watch over them and that they would remain prosperous under your care. We give you all honor and all glory. In your precious name we pray. Amen. Have a wonderful week and we will see you soon next week. Take care now.